Hello, I'm professional trumpet player and teacher Phil Savard. I teach around the and play around the Washington area, and um, today I'm playing for you Getschel's Etude Number Eighty One. This is out of his second book of Practical Studies. And today I want to go over just a, a few things to, to to look at for this piece and to work on. Um, First off, this piece is, is really about contrast. It's about style. It's about um, really creating drama with the music. And um, you, you don't always get quite that in-depth with a, uh, a simple etude out of a uh, beginner to intermediate book. Uh, but this is, this is quite exceptional. You have quite a lot to do with it. So let's, let's get down to it. First off. We want to um, make sure that we understand the uh, the words written down there. So, so many times I'll I'll go into a lesson and I'll ask the student, okay, so what does grandioso mean, or what does leggero mean? Th there should be no excuse in this day and age for not knowing what those words mean. Um, it used to mean going and looking it up in a dictionary, a music dictionary, or a uh, Italian dictionary. Nowadays, you can just go on the internet. So, so look up all those words that you don't understand. So that way you know what the composer was trying to get across to you. So that's the first thing. Know what the words mean. Second, <clears throat> make sure that you have a, a clear sense of style. I know is this first section grandioso. It's got to have this uh, almost quasi marcato sound to it, as opposed to that uh, third section, which is leggero very light, very light. Um, second section, dolce, meaning sweet. So that one's much more lyrical. Now, as you're playing this, you always want to try and think of the human voice. You want to try and phrase as if you would speak or phrase as if it would be sung. So always think in terms of where you're leading to and where you're leading away from. So your playing should always have a sense of direction to it. Now, how do you create this sense of direction? Well, the, the most obvious way is with crescendos and decrescendos. They can be big crescendos and decrescendos, and they can be very subtle. Um, the next thing is use the vibrato. The vibrato can create a sense of intensity or lightening up. And that vibrato um, has two aspects to it. There's the speed. You can change the speed, how quick or slow it is. You can also change how wide your vibrato is. So let me just take one note. Notice how that had had a crescendo and a decrescendo with it, but you also had the vibrato start off nice and slow and then get a little bit larger, a little bit more intense, and then back off. So, so you want to learn how to use that vibrato. Now, you don't necessarily want to have it in your playing all the time, but you want to use it as a tool to help express yourself and help to create that sense of direction and motion. Now, um, with vibrato, there, there's several ways to produce vibrato. Um, one is with the lip, and think of it in terms of uh, when you're buzzing, if you were to buzz on the mouthpiece, you just, you're changing the pitch a little bit with it. So a lot of it is, is up here. In other words, I'm, I'm hearing what I want my lips to produce. You can also get a little bit of vibrato with some jaw movement. And so it's going to take some experimentation and, and trial and error to, to figure out which vibrato you want to use, whether it's going to be all lip or a jaw vibrato or a combination of them. And there's also another way to produce vibrato, and that is by actually moving the hand to move the horn, which will in turn move the mouthpiece on the lip. And every every professional player kind of has their own way that they prefer. Some people do it in, in several different ways and, and use it um, according to what they feel the, p the piece requires. But uh, let me demonstrate that. It's, it's kind of, I remember Steve Hendrickson uh, explained it to me when I was back in high school as if you're turning a doorknob. So think of uh, as if you're turning a doorknob and jiggle it to see if it's unlocked. And that's the kind of motion that you want to do with your hand to just gently move the horn.
Okay. And that type of vibrato is is good because it's it's easy to um, it's easy to not overdo that vibrato. It takes a little bit more thought to add it to it. Um, me personally, I, I found that the the lip and the jaw is a little bit more intimate, and I, I connect a little bit better with it. But it's just something for you to work on and for you to practice and decide which is going to work best for you and which gives you the best results. So work on that and record yourself and then listen back to it and see if that's the desired result that you want. Um, next, for phrasing, as far as leading to and backing away from, that is also another trial and error thing. You want to experiment and, and look at it. And, and a lot of times it has to do with the phrase structure. And, and a, a good way to, to kind of start off is by saying, okay, there's the high note in the phrase. you got this nice arch shape to it. And I'm going to lead up to that and then come back with it. But that's, that's, that's a good rule to start off with, but that's not always the case. If, if you listen to that first phrase, I tend to lead to the, the, the second full measure of the piece. So li listen to this. So that's leading to that E. That's the second full measure. You could lead it lead to just that uh, the third note on the page, which is the top note of it. Notice how that works, but it has a different effect. It gives it gives you a little bit um, more resigned type of feeling. Uh, from from the beginning of that piece. So it, it produces a different musical effect. Not necessarily wrong, but just different. Now here's leading all the way down to the low A. So once again, another pr effect that, that it produces, different. Not necessarily what I, I want to say with this piece, um, but valid nonetheless. So there isn't always a right or a wrong way to do things. Now, if you're playing in a group, if you're playing in a quintet or a, a large ensemble, an orchestra or a band, you, you definitely have to have a, a sense of what the group is doing and make sure that there's a homogenous sound so that everybody matches. In, in a group like an orchestra or a band, you always want to listen up to hear what what the first trumpet player is doing, or or even if it's if you're the first trumpet player, you can kind of listen around the orchestra to hear what everybody else is doing, and hopefully they're listening to you. But the, the first trumpet player c tends to set what the phrase <clears throat> excuse me what the phrase is going to be. <clears throat> now, ultimately though, the the trumpet, first trumpet player has to answer to the conductor. So if the conductor doesn't like it, then he usually has to change it. Um, so. Experiment with phrases, lots of trial and error, and go ahead and record yourself and listen back just so that you know that, that that's the, really the effect that you want. Because sometimes what you think you're doing and what's actually coming out isn't always the same. Let's see. Um, next, rhythm. Rhythm is really important for this piece. We've got that dotted eighth sixteenth, and we have it in two different styles. We have it in this kind of marcato, bold, grandioso style at the beginning, and then later on in the third section, we have it in this very light, leggero style. Um, so, so we must be able to do it in both styles, but probably more importantly is to have the proper subdivision. Um, a lot of younger players tend to play this more like a, a triplet pattern, da 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 da, division of three, and we definitely want to have a division of four. So practicing this subdivided should really help out. And so what you want to do is practice it over and over and over like that and just get it second nature so that you're, you're able to subdivide subconsciously. As soon as you play that rhythm, you're not even thinking about it consciously, but your brain is going, yeah, da, 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 and, and you always want to have that going on kind of in the back of your head. And it, it won't go on by itself until you've established it with lots of practice, 
playing it uh, with the subdivision. Now make sure whenever you're subdividing or kind of creating these little exercises for yourself that you, you always create it with musicality in your head. Um, we, we can also add the subdivision to those quarter notes and the eighth notes uh, so that we get the proper tie leading over because that's another spot that I hear students messing up is that tie, getting off the tie on time. And so what I actually recommend there is not a 16th note subdivision, which you can do, but I recommend an eighth note subdivision. So here it is with both subdivisions. So like that. And all the other phrases that are similar to that subdivide as well. Okay, so let's next go to the Leggero section. So here's that same rhythm, that same dotty sixteenth, but with a lighter feel. So there it is in the Leggero section. Notice a lot lighter on the tongue, and that's exactly what Leggero means is light. And um, oh, w one other thing with that Donnie at 16th, we've got it in the Dolce, so a lyrical. So, so as you're doing these subdivisions, make sure you're also matching the style and thinking in terms of phrase and musicality. So another element of the, this piece that I want to touch briefly upon is the change in tempos. Um, and, and not necessarily between the grandioso and, and then you go down to a main amoso and then the leggero piumoso, but... But even within those sections, there's a lot of liberty and a lot of, uh, I think, with this, within this style, the ability to add some rubato. Now, what, what I played for you at the beginning of this was with maybe a hint of a rubato. But I want to show you how it, it can be fairly effective to, to, to add quite a bit to it. Now, a word of warning, um, make sure that you can practice this steady in tempo and use the metronome and just... Click it away nice and steady first before you attempt to add any rubato because it takes that, that steady pulse and then as you're playing to manipulate the pulse and then the music lines up with that pulse. So, so as I'm trying to figure out what I want to do with the rubato, what I actually do is I'll actually sing this and I'll, I'll either snap my fingers or I'll kind of conduct along. And so w when I'm creating a rubato, that, that stretching and speeding up and slowing down, I'm not really thinking of speeding up and slowing down the music, but it's actually the pulse. My internal pulse is speeding up and slowing down. So here's, here's with quite a bit of rubato.
Now, as I said with, with the phrasing, this is one of those things where you definitely want to record yourself so that you can hear what you're doing. And, and as you're listening back, kind of tap through the pulse and listen to it. Because with, with any of these really subjective things that, that are, are beyond what's written on the page, they can be done well and they can also be done kind of poorly. And you'll get this kind of stuttering and speeding up and almost as if you're driving in a car and someone's slamming on the brakes. And we don't want that. We want everything to be very smooth. And yes, some of it can be be sudden, sudden, but when it is sudden, it's a very smooth transition into that slowing down rather than a jerkiness. So listening can really help out. Because ultimately, when you're thinking in terms of phrasing, in terms of um, retardando, rallentando, uh, rubato, we want it to work. We want, we want to listen to it and, and go, ah, that's the way it's supposed to sound. And then play it a different way with robotos in a different section and phrase leading to a different note and listen to it and go, ah, that's the way it's supposed to sound. So we've got several different uh, interpretations, and some of them can be completely different. And yet if they work, you listen to it, and you, you, you know that that's the way it's supposed to be, even though it's totally different than the other way that you heard, which feels like that's the way it's supposed to be. And that's the sign of a good interpretation, is when it feels right, even though it's different than something else that felt right. So make sure you listen to yourself. And, and also listen to other great players. Um, because if, if you listen to them and then imitate, and that, that might not be your interpretation or the way that you kind of hear it, but if you can learn to imitate them and then imitate another great player and then imitate another great player, you'll eventually develop a really good sense of what you want to say as an artist. So the, the step to developing phrasing and learning what you want to say really is th that that first step is imitation, imitation of a whole bunch of different artists, and then you can eventually develop what you want to say with it. Thank you, and I hope this was helpful for you.